2022 meeting of the Rutherford County Regional Planning Commission. If you would stand with us, please, Commissioner Charlotte P. will lead us in our prayer and our pledge. Charlotte. Thank you. Shall we pray? Thank you, Almighty God, for this opportunity to come together and hold county business. Please grant us wisdom and continue to bless us. Please bless the Damasi family and grant them healing. Forgive our shortcomings, Lord. Uh, be with those that are in need. Be with those that are in authority. And be with those that put themselves in harm's way for our freedoms and our safety. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Call the roll, please, Gail. Jim Averwater. Here. Pettis Reed. Here. Mike Cush. Present. Lee Vogel. Here. Charlotte P. Here. Rhonda Allen. David Jones. Here. Craig Lynch. Here. Chip Pinion. Marvin Whitworth. Here. Jeff Phillips. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, Gail. This time I'll call on our Vice Chair Pettis Reed for the reading of the minutes from our July 25th and August 8th meeting. Pettis. Mr. Chairman, I have gone over both these sets of meetings from July 25th and August 8th. I find no problems. I move they be approved. <laughs> we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes from our July 25th and August 8th meeting. All those in favor of that motion to approve, please say aye. Any opposition? Motion to approve carries. Thank you. We have one item that's been uh, withdrawn uh, today, and that's item 6A2, Rosewood Retreat, item number 22-2052. You have any comments on that, Doug? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, the reason we're pulling this off the agenda is as a preliminary plan, it requires a will serve letter from CUD and Middle Tennessee Electric. Uh, as of this morning, we did not have those unless the applicant is here and happens to have them with him, them, which I don't think is the case. Uh, we'll remove this off the agenda until we receive it. Very good. Thank you, Doug. How are you feeling, by the way? I'm here. I'm doing better. Thank you. <laughs> um, getting into new business, item 6A1. This is a, a preliminary plan for Pine Valley Farms. The item number is 22-1008. 83 lots on 35.8 acres zoned PUD located along East Compton Road. MHW Investment Partners is the applicant. Doug? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, this property was rezoned back to Plan Development PUD back in May of 2020. It was originally called Kings Mill Estates. Uh, this plan appears to be consistent with the approved concept plan. There were a little bit of lot shifting, especially in the kind of toward the back where lots 43 through 54, 54 are located. That was really to better accommodate the open space. They didn't lose any open space. Actually, the, the way they shifted the lots made a lot more sense. So we consider that a minor deviation from the approved plan that was presented in the pattern book, so not a real big issue there. This item was originally considered by the Planning Commission back in June of this year. It was deferred at that time due to the drainage concerns that are present with this subdivision. Uh, those concerns are still there. I'm gonna turn this over to Mike to get, let him make some introductory comments, and I believe the design engineer is here to make some additional comments on that as well. Good. Let me make a quick comment. There are those in the audience that are here to, uh, about this particular topic. Uh, Mike is going to go over uh, the drainage situation, so you guys pay attention, and then if you still have questions, I'll recognize you to make a comment, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Phillips. Um, this item was deferred from, I believe, the end of June 25th, uh, 8th, sorry, to June 28th uh, Planning Commission meeting due to uh, drainage concerns and uh, the design engineer Matt Taylor with SEC is here and he will go over uh, what they are proposing but there is a large drainage basin essentially uh, and I'll turn on 
quad maps, there are approximately 675-ish acres that drains all the way over from the, the quarry on Twin Oaks uh, through the edge of this property and then out in the northern part of this property crossing um, Compton. And from there, it goes through some, some farmland and, it, and crosses Vinson Road a little bit farther to the northeast. So with that drainage concern, we felt that we needed to uh, have the design team look into this a little bit more, come up with a plan that we feel that won't um, impact the neighbors and if any way could improve the situation, hopefully that they can help improve the situation. But um, with this large drainage basin, um, we are concerned about people downstream, obviously, but also upstream. So that is where we were with the, the last plan. And uh, if you allow uh, Chairman Phillips to allow uh, Matt Taylor to come up and talk about this. Uh, he can go over their proposed plan. Absolutely, Mr. Taylor. Matt, you can't look, use too much detail, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. So Matt Taylor of SCC, uh, as Mike said, I think we were here in June, and so we've spent uh, the time since then um, developing our drainage uh, calculations. Uh, nothing we wouldn't have done um, in a normal scheme of um, design, it's just we accelerated it. Instead of being with construction plans, we moved it up to the preliminary plan to try to address uh, the questions of the neighbors and this board. And so we really had two separate items here. Uh, one of those is, um, if you're looking at the screen, the bottom right hand, uh, it's Mr. Jake's house. Um, he came and expressed some concerns. Um, and so part of our drainage analysis, we looked at how much area we could take off of his property. We're able to capture and divert approximately 17% of the watershed that goes toward him. The majority of the watershed um, does not run through our property and so we can't physically affect that. But what we could affect, we diverted into a on-site detention pond and it were, will release away from him. And so we're not gonna fix his issue, but we are going to help it by diverting water and diverting area away from his house. Then the other outfall was in the um, right up there where Mike's got the hand cursor there. And so that is, today there's four 24 inch pipes there. We're going to leave those pipes and extend those into our site. We're gonna build a large detention pond there so that um, we don't increase the rate of runoff and we don't uh, increase the frequency of that overtopping. I think Mr. Jakes had uh, talked about that overtopping in our uh, previous meeting. And so we went through and modeled all the storm events to make sure that uh, the water surface elevation in that feature does not increase under our design scenarios. And so that will not only protect um, the downstream, that also protects the upstream neighbors because it's not increasing the water surface. In addition to that, working with Mike, we're going to over excavate the pond approximately four feet lower than uh, the bottom. So it will hold extra water, uh, especially on the less or the more frequent storm events. So that'll be kind of a belts and suspenders approach. We've also went ahead and set minimum pad elevations for the lots inside of our subdivision so that they um, do not experience an issue. So um, again, all this is things we normally would have done with Mike just after this meeting, but we went ahead and accelerated those. And so we've met with Mike and Sheila on a couple of different occasions to work um, to go over the calculations and tweak them at their request. Well, let me let me add something to that. So, what we asked them to do uh, is to model this drainage basin. So, this area uh, with these four 24-inch culverts uh, essentially creates a 
detention area already. So it's holding back water right now. And we asked them to model this area, say what happens in each of our storm events, the two, five, 25, 50 year storm events. And we can use that as a baseline moving forward saying, okay, we know what's going on right now. And with this new development, how are you gonna impact that? And that's what, what they've, uh, we've had them go through. And like Matt said, typically this is always done at the construction plan phase, but because of the drainage concerns, we asked them to go ahead and move that up and, and look at this on the front end. So um, that's, that's where we are. They are, um, go back to the plan real quick, and I'm sorry to jump in, but they, let me back up. They're capturing a lot of the existing uh, subdivision in this pond here that'll also help um, take out some of the water that's going towards the Jake's property down in this little bowl down here. So, and then also, like he said, they're over ex excavating this area. And then he also, I'll, I made him do a pinky promise that if we needed to lose some more lots, we're gonna, he's gonna lose some more lots. So if we need to expand this area, um, once we get you know, a better uh, finalized design of the whole system, he, he's okay with that. I'm sure the developer's kind of cringing uh, at that, but uh, it is what it is. If we need to make this area larger, um, he's okay with that. Thank you, Mike. This might be a good point. Uh, to um, allow a couple of residents to speak. And uh, there were a couple that came up and talked to me. Uh, Mr. Hawkins, do you have questions after hearing this? Not at this time. Very good, thank you. And uh, Mr. Vincent, Billy Vincent, do you still have questions at this time? Hold, hold on a second, you need, to, you need to come up if you would, please. <coughs> Take your time. I ain't much of a speaker. Uh, I've got pictures here. I'm 84 years old. I've lived out there on the same property for 75 years. Y'all, not particularly y'all, but the, the Bill Planning Commission and all has told me over the years, you would control the water, starting with Briarwood. All it's done is flooded me ever since. Every time you add something, it floods. And it's getting worse. I've spent a bunch of money to keep the water out of my barn. The county or nobody has helped me. Now it's getting close to my house and it ain't gonna get no better. This is gonna make it a whole lot worse. You cannot control all the water when you cover the ground up that extra water is going to run off i've got pictures if anybody wants them it's they dated i don't know how come he do that and keep him but i have but it's a big concern every time anybody knows if you cover a square foot of ground up it will not soak up water, and you look at all the housing. Now, this goes back years ago. I can't find the records. But when this property first started, it was 27 homes years ago. The state inspector turned it down because the soil went now. I guess the soils got better over the years instead of worse. A few years ago, it was 70-something. Now it's 80-something. And it's just going to get worse. And that's all I've got to say. I wish y'all would consider it more. If, if y'all would ride out there when the water was up, you'd see what I'm talking about. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Vincent. Yes. Yes, you can. If you would give us your name and address.
So I'm, I'm Tony Mosley, live at 2890 Roy Arnold Road. I've lived out there about five years. First, let me say I appreciate what y'all do for, for the community. Um, <clears throat> I think SEC Engineering, Matt, put in the River Birch subdivision and put in detention ponds like they are proposing for this one. And either one of two things, they weren't designed correctly or they don't work properly. So all the neighbors, and myself included, that are between River Birch and this proposed Pine Valley, <laughs> all of that water, <clears throat> those detention ponds at River Birch sit there full year round. One of them does. So all that excess water then comes on us. We've made a substantial investment out there in our homes and improving our properties. So common sense tells you if you have all this water, why don't you increase those size of those culverts under the road? Well, that's gonna impact the uh, homeowners that are downstream. They don't wanna do that. But what about us upstream? This is gonna act as a dam and cause more water, guaranteed, any engineer will tell you that. Now the developer wants to build a lot of homes and he's gonna say, well, no, we'll put in these detention ponds. They're gonna work exactly like they do at River Birch and all that water comes in, and everyone sitting back here has got pictures. I live with it. I'm sick and tired of this water on my property. So I'm gonna be a gentleman and tell you that I don't want it, and I would encourage you to consider the feelings of us that live upstream, just as Mike mentioned, because it's gonna impact us. You wouldn't want it in your backyard. We're sick and tired of it being in our backyard. Thank you, Mr. Mosley. Let, let me add something, if I may, Chairman. Um, what we're looking at under Compton Road, there are four 24-inch CMP pipes right here with that large drainage basin. The next downstream structure it kind of flows through this farmland and then crosses right here. You've got a double box culvert, six foot by 12 foot wide. So it's significantly larger drainage structure here. Uh, so that's, that's the quandary we're in and the highway department's in. If we were to open this up, uh, the first drainage structure under East Compton, that allows more water to flow through and essentially eliminates this detention area that they're in right now. So that's, that's we're caught in a, between a rock and a hard place. But anything that we do, we will require that, they're, that they not increase any more water uh, running downstream than, than, than is currently happening right now. Very good. Matt, any additional comments or anything you would like to follow up on? Very good, thank you. Doug, I can try to explain what we're going through as it relates to a, <clears throat> a, a, a PUD, but I believe this <clears throat> piece of property was scheduled, uh, was rezoned for a PUD back two years ago in 2020. Yes, sir. So if, if you can try to explain it a lot better than I can uh, to people that are out here, what our job is today. Correct, thank you. Yes, the zoning of the property, as you stated, uh, Chairman, was uh, approved back in 2020. So the zoning of the property is pretty much a settled item at this point. Uh, I got an email from one of the surrounding neighbors that expressed some concern <clears throat> about not receiving notice of this meeting. And the reason that there was no notice sent for this meeting is because at this point, this is a use by right. Okay, this is not a situation where the use of the property is up for debate. You know, the use of the property is allowed based on the comments that were made during those public hearings, the zoning that was approved back at that time, back in 2020, ultimately the pattern book that was approved. So what the Planning Commission is looking at today is primarily, does it meet the regulations that the county has? Uh, that's what a lot of this discussion has been about. Um, and I know that Mike and Sheila, Duncan, uh, in our office, they take a lot of time and they take a lot of care to look at the drainage of these subdivisions that come in here. You know, obviously the ones that happened, you know, 
years before either Mike or I were here, there's not a whole lot we can do about, but at least moving forward, we can look at regulations that have changed and those kind of things and make sure that these subdivisions are not gonna create any more issues from a drainage standpoint than uh, may be out there currently today. So that's, I guess, the long way of saying what we're looking at today is has the design engineer met the comments that staff has had in regard to drainage and also the planning issues and things which, relatively speaking, were, were minor compared to what we're dealing with on the drainage. Uh, so that's what the Planning Commission has to decide based on staff's input. You know, do we, do the commission feel based on staff's recommendation that they have done enough to meet our concerns? So. And Mike, feel free to chime in on anything. You can kind of see um, the original road network that was cut in a long time ago with the original plan. I think there was um, a road that was coming through here in a cul-de-sac. And I don't, I believe the lots were going to be cut off of this uh, interior road right here. So we, uh, we've worked with the highway department. Um, trying to help the, the, uh, the Jakes out. Um, before I uh, started working with the county, they worked on a little um, drainage improvement project, this little blue right, line right here. They, um, unfortunately what happens with the Jakes property, they're, they're kind of in a bowl. The house receives, gets water up underneath the crawl space and heavy rain events. It, uh, drains under their driveway and then crosses right in here. Uh, and then the highway department came out and cleaned this out uh, and then it kind of dumps into a sinkhole in this area. But the, the downstream neighbors made it adamantly clear that they didn't want any more water. So the highway department said, okay, we've, we've done what we can do without permission from downstream neighbors. So. That's, that's kind of the quandary that we're in. Um, if, if you opened up the drainage system under uh, Compton, you're, you're allowing more water to flow freely downstream uh, to the property on the north side of Compton Road before it gets to Vinson. So, and that's, that's kind of the, the situation we're in. We always um, diligently look at every every project every drainage plan um, we also you know require that we're not impacting the neighbors if we if we can uh, help it even make it in some improvements so i've asked them to you know over excavate uh, this area it won't help with the larger storm events they'll still roll through here but the smaller ones can help um, be detained in this area right here so they feel that they've got a good plan together. We haven't seen the entire plan, but they they have looked at uh, the pre and post stormwater evaluations of this, and they feel that they can make this work uh, with what what they've got. There are some photographs. I think. Okay. These are some photos that were emailed to us, and there's a, a, a very short video. If you wanted to click on that, Mike, you could just. This yeah. is, uh, I believe, upstream. Um, I believe this is a driveway um, upstream of this development. I believe it's in this gravel driveway here. Drainage from this large drainage basin if, kind of flows through. This area crosses 3798. Okay, here and here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it crosses these driveways in a couple pla places. 3798's here. So when this water is up, it builds up, builds up, builds up, and backs over the top of this this driveway because this these four 24-inch culverts can only allow so much water through them, and then in uh, in frequent times it goes up and over uh, Compton Road. So that's kind of what they're experiencing, the water backing up, backing up into their, their driveways. 
show you a couple more. So there's, there's another driveway with water over the top of it. Not sure where this one is, but it's, I would say it's probably in that same, same area. Here's, here's another, the, another driveway, gravel driveway with water over the top of it. So like I said, it's, it's a large, large um, drainage culvert uh, or drainage basin, I should say, that, that comes through this area. And flows through here. So they they made a plan that says, okay, we're going to have two detention ponds. One pond on this side is going to capture three quarters of the subdivision, and we're going to detain it here. And then, but we're also going to oversize this one that will treat the quarter of the uh, subdivision plus over oversize the area here. So that's that's their plan essentially in a nutshell. Um, if this were a, a flowing stream, we could have them upsize these culverts to help with this situation, but um, without permission from the downstream property owners, um, please. would give us your name <coughs> my name's Carl Flam and uh, like the concerns of everybody downstream I live upstream in between the two subdivisions. I've got photographs, now I don't live by East Compton, I live a third of a mile off. Some of them driveways you've seen is my driveways that they took pictures of that I go out. I have pictures that's in between me and my neighbor that's not in driveways that is a lot more water than what is over the driveways. I get flooding, I actually had a neighbor took a kayak with him and his daughter between me and their house because the water was that high, they didn't even have to put paddles in. They could go all the way down through the yard through a kayak. That's how bad it gets. I have a picture here, which just was 10th, August 10th of this year. And the rain was not a heavy rain like what you're all talking about with big floods. And I can show you flooding and all that back then. And this was with an inch and a half, two inch rain. So you can imagine what it looks like when we start getting five inches of rain and four inches of rain. The yard, I have pictures that shows where neighbor's shed was getting underwater, his little storage shed. He had to move it because of that. And I think one of the pictures you showed of a shed up there was my backyard before I built the house, as we was building the house, with it flooding close to my shed. But that's the neighbors coming down on me, but it does run out. But then when it gets in between me and the others, it heads towards the property that you all want to develop. My concern is just like theirs, you putting more water on them is going to flood them more. Slowing it down is going to flood me longer. You know, it does re go down, give it a day. It will recede. But there is times my daughter and wife couldn't even come to the house or leave the house in a car and a van because the water is that deep. I get through in a pickup truck, but that's a little different. So I'd just like you to take that in consideration if you would, and I'll leave you some pictures. Thank you. Commissioners. Mike, where does all this water flow? Does it go to the river? Where does it? It eventually winds up at the river. And let me. So you've got this large drainage basin that flows through the northern part of this development, crosses under Compton, 
crosses these farms and Vinson Road here uh, with that large double box culvert and kind of meanders back and forth until it gets to the river. Mike, you said uh, a rock and a hard place. I think everybody in this room is between a rock and a hard place right now. What do uh, you said oversi oversizing some of these uh, uh, drainage areas? Uh, does let's talk about oversizing them even more? Is that going to help? Well, it will help with the smaller. They can hold back what the extra runoff they're creating. And Matt, go ahead and come on up. Uh, and I'll let him kind of explain, but that's kind of what we asked him to do. I said, look at the ground, what, what it is, the runoff from this development right now, how this, this area is functioning as an existing detention pond, even though it wasn't designed as one, with the elevated road, it that road becomes a berm and those pipes that threw it are the outlet structure of this natural detention area. So we asked them to look at that uh, and what happens and Matt, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so we're doing a few things. We are oversizing, we're uh, digging deeper in the pond. We're also, we also added another pond and we're diverting most of our site to that pond toward the south. We're gonna let it capture and hold and it releases back slowly so that some of this water can, some of the offsite water can get out of our system before we release our upstream pond. And so that, that will, help in that manner. Now the pictures for the driveways, that is purely a function of elevation because their driveways are in approximately a 578 elevation, I believe is what I saw earlier. Um, and the road where this overtops in front of our property is at a 579, 580. And so whenever those pipes get overwhelmed and it's overtopping, it is, that's just math. It, it's gonna back up. There's nothing that this property can do. You would physically have to start upsizing those culverts, raising Compton, raising their driveways to make to change that at all. And so this property is not, it's gonna help. It's not gonna fix that, um, but it's not gonna, it's definitely not gonna hurt. We meet and exceed the regulations um, for subdivision. So um, we can help, but we, we can't solve that. Um, they could raise their driveways. Uh, that would help as much as anything. That was a gentleman that talking about upstream coming down. Yes, sir. Okay. And so we've intentionally designed this so it does not act as a dam anymore. It's, it's designed so that it mimics today or improves from today. And so we did not want to exacerbate anything. That's exactly what we've uh, give Mike inside these calculations is, you know, we're going to help where we can and certainly not exacerbate anything. Any questions Sir, I, have a, I have a question for Matt. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Um, so the neighborhood, the fellow from River Birch that he mentioned, mm -hmm. do you ever go back and sort of do a lessons learned, sort of reevaluate? Is there anything that you would have done differently that you, because I know sometimes topography doesn't always behave exactly like we anticipate that it will. So what happens in a situation like that where it doesn't function the way it should or was expected? Or is it, fun in your opinion, is it functioning the way it's supposed to? So I actually met with Mr. Mosley uh, several months ago before this it wasn't in regards to this project. He wanted to talk about drainage on his lot. And so I sat down with him. I think he also came and met with Sheila as well. Um, I'm almost positive we did not design those detention ponds. I think we did section two, which is kind of the long cul-de-sac. The others, what it looked like to me, what I share with Mr. Mosley, I'm not very intimately, I don't know that pond very well. It looked like to me there was probably some maintenance or lack thereof that had not been performed because it's holding water like that. It was also an existing pond, like an old farm pond before that site was developed based on some old historical aerials that I found. And so I think that there's a couple of things going on there. And I. I 
I don't know the 100% answer to that, but I shared with Mr. Mosley some things I thought that could help his drainage situation. Uh, I think Sheila did the same. You know, there's a possibility that he also has a natural spring on the front of some of his property as well. Uh, so there were several, mul multiple things, a lot of parts of that conversation. So. Um, do I go back and look at things? Yes. I mean, whenever it rains, I, I intentionally look at our projects. Um, you know, I, do I get to go look at every one every time? No, ma'am. But I do try to go and look at ponds, especially if I know they're sensitive. And we have a lot of ears and eyes in the community, so if something's not working, they let us know. We go try to figure it out. Sometimes it's maintenance. Sometimes it's under construction. So there's multiple reasons why something may not be functioning like it should. And, and I know we've had this conversation before. Um, I've asked you this question publicly before, which is if you get it wrong, mm -hmm. what, you know, what does that mean to you as an engineer? So your level of confidence has to be pretty dang high for you to put your stamp on this. Correct? Right, absolutely. And so, you know, we've been here um, for 40 some odd years and we're not going anywhere. Um, I have to come up here before you all every month. And so um, for me to come up here and say, we're not gonna hurt, you know, I'm very honest. I, I can't solve all these problems, but I can certainly not make them worse. And, and that's, what our, that's what the regulations say. And, and we try to help where we can. And so we're 100% positive about that. But to even to be more specific, for those neighbors who are listening, your license. Absolutely. Is, and is and insured. And, uh, that's yeah. right. And so anybody, as well as Mike and Sheila, they're both licensed. So not only is it just people in my office that will be reviewing and designing this, Mike and Sheila will be scrutinizing this as it goes uh, through the construction plan process. So to, and today is not the end all be all. It does have to go through multiple other reviews with Mike and Sheila's uh, office as well um, before it ever gets uh, permitted or well, before we can put a shovel in the ground. So a lot more scrutiny will go to, into these plans as well. Mr. Mosley. Anything personal against Matt Taylor or SEC? I'm not a licensed engineer. I've never claimed to be. I'm simply a resident that is concerned about the value of my property. Now, how hard is it for someone to tell me who put in those detention ponds? For him to stand here and say, you know, I can't, I don't know if we did it or not. Well, what happens five years from now when that is a dam that's backing up on me and all of my other neighbors? Are we going to have to go through, well, I don't know who put that in. Maybe it wasn't designed correctly. But all of you have properties you would share the same concerns that we have. So I just ask for you, we're not professional engineers, and he comes and sees you all the time, but we are concerned residents. I have a follow -up. So have you had a conversation with Mike and with Doug at the county? Because at the county level, we ought to be able to tell you who designed those ponds. Yes. I have had a conversation with Matt Taylor and Mike and Sheila. The and, right. you know, I'm, I'm not at liberty to tell you what they told me in those private conversations, but I think they have genuine concerns as well that this may act as a dam. And you can sit here all day and say, well, I'm not going to exacerbate the problem. Putting 80 houses in there is going to exacerbate the problem. And that's just common sense. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chair, may I call a point of order, please? This is not a public comment and a back and forth session. We've we have some serious business to discuss here and some questions to ask of Matt Taylor. So noted, Commissioner Averwater. I've tried to explain to you guys this is not a public hearing. We've let this thing go on. I've had a point of order, which means that no one else will be allowed to speak. Uh, and I, I'm going to tell you that this commission is uh, gnashing their teeth right now to try to figure out what to do. Uh, Nick, you may not want to add anything, uh, but if, if you can further explain what our job is today, and I just don't know if I could do an adequate job or not, 
our job is to look at this piece of property. And if it's approved, are we going to cause harm for anyone else? That's our job. The issues that you guys are having is real, and this commission feels from our heart what you're going through. But our job today, Nick, uh, if you'll help me state that better. Uh, I think that's 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 well said, but I'll just build off what Mr. DeMossi said earlier, and they, correct me if I'm wrong on the history of this, but this was already the subject of a rezoning proceeding how long ago? A year ago or so? About, about two years. About two years ago where there was public hearing and when the determination was made by this body to approve it then, it, it, it I assume considered um, whether this was appropriate or not uh, use for the area. And so being now that it is a use by right uh, and that they have been vested in the PUD, um, I imagine that they can build this. The, the, the duty of this body at this hearing is to determine whether the design plan meets the criteria in the subdivision regulations. It's, this body now is sitting more in an administrative capacity. And so as long as it is meeting the requirements of the subdivision regulations for appropriate drainage and infrastructure um, as it relates to the building of the site, I think that that's what this concentration needs to be on uh, today. And so I would rely on your staff with that as well. Once again, just summarizing our job to look at this piece of property and do our best to ensure that the plan for this piece of property is doing no additional harm for anybody else. That's a decision that we're making. And you've heard uh, the engineering, the engineers pretty much say that the plan is to contain everything that's coming off that piece of property. They've even made the statement that it should help a little bit for surrounding pieces of property. So that's a decision that we've got to make. Uh, does it meet our standards? Well, that's where we are. Right. And if I may add, Chairman, that uh, Again, this has to go through our construction plan review. Um, I am the county engineer, but also the chief worry wart in the county. So <laughs> I worry greatly about this as if I lived upstream or downstream. So I would not want this impacting anybody around. Um, so they've, they've uh, looked at the pre-development rate of runoff, Compton overtops the road frequently. Um, they believe they can hold back their additional runoff, that they're not increasing the rate of runoff and, and raising the water that over that overtops Compton Road right now. So they're, um, they're doing everything they can and they've also assured me that if we find that, that in the construction plan review that we need some more area, they're gonna lose some lots. They are going to lose some lots if if they need need to um, so that's it's a long long drawn out process um, if if we could upsize Compton and allow the water to flow you've you've helped the people upstream but then you're sending more water downstream so we're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place and we're just doing the best we can on this property here so uh, that, that's where we're standing Mr. Chair, I have a question for either Mr. Hughes or Mr. Taylor, maybe perhaps both of them would want to address it. Uh, and I'm thinking about sinkholes, inflows or outflows. Do you have any evidence of uh, that sort of thing? Yes. I can pull up another map. I, out on this property, we um, there does appear to be one sinkhole. We've not heard of any outflows on this property. I think that uh, Mr. Hughes had shared with me that somebody had said downstream of us, um, I think directly across the street from Mr. Jake's, I don't remember that property owner's name, um, they had reported water coming out of their sinkhole at times, but nothing like that here. This is a map of the dye tracings in the area that the city and county have, have done over time. There is not 
um, mapped traces, dye traces in this area, that, but that's not to say that there aren't some in this area. So that's, that's another facet that we have to uh, contend with all the time is, is if, you know, are we changing the underground flow as well? So much of this area, uh, much of the county actually is in a sinkhole watershed. Um, and I'm not sure if this area is or not. I believe it flows to um, the east fork of the river. So it eventually gets there. But I don't believe there are sinkholes, there are springs, and, and based on um, neighbors' um, experiences, I believe there's one up uh, close to, to Compton up here in this area uh, from what we've been told. Mr. Chair. Mike. Matt, this is for you and Michael. It did, Mike, did I understand in your opening uh, uh, of this project that the four 24-inch pipes that are currently under Compton are going to be extended into the stormwater detention pond? Right. They're, that's one of the things that has to be fine-tuned. They're they're going to tie to those culverts and extend those in. So well, they're, they're trying, to, trying to mimic what's happening now. Okay. So, so in other words, then, the flow, the, the rainwater that comes into the detention pond on that, I guess that's north, in lot 75, that open space on the master plan, that water that will drain to that detention pond from the site and from upstream from the neighbors, how does that water crest, uh, you know, if it's a detention pond, it's going to have a, a berm around it, right? How, how does that water crest and flow into the pond? I can yeah, yeah, is there that. is there an outlet, is there an inlet pipe through the, <laughs> through the detention <clears throat> No, sir. We're not going to berm up the north side. So that we're describing that as a detention pond up there because we're going to wind up excavating below the bottom of those pipes to create that additional storage. Our main pond that's going to capture the majority of our site is going to be on the south side, and we're going to release into that you want to call it a stormwater feature, however you want to term that. It's acting like a pond today. We are not going to berm up okay. on our northern side. We're going to let that continue to flow like it does today. So when you say you're going to excavate four feet deeper than what's really needed, mm, yes. will that four feet of extra capacity be below the invert of those 424s? Yes. So will that always hold water? So and it, just and by evaporation, I, I don't I don't think it will because today it does that area does not hold water all the time and so and some of that area has already been excavated. Now will it hold water for an extended period? I believe yes, but it will not hold it all the time. The water there's already somebody had dug out a pond or something there. It looks like to me started digging something, but it does not hold water all the time today. Other questions? Mike, do you have the 2010 flood maps and the property around it um, that the first gen the gentleman mentioned that's where the ponds are not working, was that developed at the time of 2010? Was that already there? The subdivision, um, River Birch, I believe it was. Yes. <clears throat> These several houses have been yet to build. This is the pond, one of the ponds at River Birch that has to build up, spill over, and go through this land and meet up with this dra big drainage basin. Here is another pond up front, and this is an area held water. I think this was natural depression. I think that spring is somewhere in this area, probably bubbling up in here. But I'll go back to the site. And 
let me say that it was not a uniform rain event all over the county. The northwest part of the county got a lot more rain than other parts of the county. So this, this area got a heavy amount of rain, but it was not uh, like the Nashville or Smyrna or other areas. Um, but this is the pond and the 2010 aerial imagery two days after it quit raining. And you can see still holding water uh, downstream from that is the flow path that goes to that big box culvert that crosses under Vincent Road right in here, drains on. That's, you know, I think in this area, water gets up, goes over Compton pretty quick because it's such a large area and those four culverts can only handle so much flow. Other questions? Need a motion. Mr. Chair, I, I think my concern is going to be, what if we do nothing? What about maintaining the status quo? Uh, it doesn't appear that that's working too well. This project does appear to meet all the uh, regulations that we've established and the big one of course right now is don't make it any worse and if there's anything you can do to make it better make it better and um, I think SEC has got a pretty good track record of that therefore I'll make a motion to approve we have a motion and a second to approve with all of staff comments yes, sir. item number 22-1008 Pine Valley Farms. Mr. Chairman, I, I, before we vote, I just have one comment, and this is really more for the neighbors than anything. It, it's always the challenge of this planning commission to balance all property owners' rights. So the struggle is when a lot of folks come in, usually everybody's a little bit right. So, but the responsibility on this particular applicant is not to fix the problems that currently exist. It's to be able to develop their property and not exacerbate issues or cause new problems. So that's the challenge and that's where we're kind of stuck between the rock and the hard place. We're not denying <coughs> current issues exist, but we can't prove and it's not been proven to us that this is gonna make it worse. And based on conversation with staff and with applicant, um, it does seem to meet all of our regulations. So that's where we're at before when we cast this vote. Thank you, Commissioner Allen. A any other questions, any other comments? Once again, we have a motion and a second to approve item 22-1008. All those in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. aye. Opposition, motion to approve carries. Thank you. Item 6A, Two has been withdrawn. Item 6B, we have one item that's been submitted for final plat approval, 6B1. The item number is 22-2059, 2105 Kingwood Lane Subdivision. Three lots on 6.05 acres zoned RM located along Kingwood Lane. Hensley Group is the applicant. Doug? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, the applicant would like to divide this property into three lots. Uh, lot one will contain an existing house. Lots two and three will be for new homes. Uh, all lots will have adequate road frontage. When you look at the plat, you can see that the flag lots for lots two and three, there's a cross access easement uh, between both of those. So it looks like they're gonna be sharing a driveway, which is, which is fine. Uh, most of our comments have been addressed. Really the only one outstanding <clears throat> at this point, and it's not one that, I think necessarily needs to uh, be deferred for this, but the uh, I don't recall that we ever received a fire hydrant determination from CUD on this one from the applicant. Uh, if it turns out that a fire hydrant cannot be uh, handled at this property, then it'll have to be 
Uh, there's not one within a thousand feet based on the shown on the plat, but uh, if it if it can support it, they just put it in. If not, then you may see this again asking for a waiver. At which point they would have to this be a three lot subdivision. They'd have to do sprinklers for the last two lots. But beyond that issue, uh, the plat itself is in good order. So with that, if you have any questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Recommendation. Approve approval. It's in good shape. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Questions and concerns, Commission. Meet, meets all the requirements? Yes, sir. If it has to have a fire hydrant waiver, you'll see it again. But uh, at this point, they're not asking for that. Make a motion to approve. Staff comments. We have a motion staff comments. and a second yes. to yes, approve sir. with staff comments. Uh, Pettis made a second. Once again, motion and a second to approve item 22-2059, Kingwood and Lane subdivision. Any other questions or comments? Greg. Greg made the motion with comments and Pettis made the second. All those in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. aye. Any opposition? Motion to approve carries. Thank you. Item 6C, we have one item that's been submitted for site plan approval, 6C1. The item number is 22-3018, FJB, Lot 2, construction of 18,000 square foot general retail trade facility on 3.97 acres, zone CS, located along Lebanon Pike, Highway 231. FJB Limited is the applicant. Doug. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as you stated, the applicant's proposing to construct a building on this property for retail trade uses. Uh, we did have several comments on the plan. Uh, what you're seeing here, uh, the most up-to-date plan, pretty much addresses things from the planning and, and uh, zoning standpoint. Uh, there are still a couple of outstanding comments on the landscaping plan and the photometric plan. We can work those out with uh, the applicant prior to any building permits being issued. A lot of it just goes back, especially the photometric plan goes back to readability of the plan. It's just difficult to interpret uh, there was some issues uh, in the regarding the parking in the rear of the building you can see there's some loading areas back there uh, and then you see some regular parking spaces back in that area as well uh, one of our concerns was the fact that well how usable are those spots in the back going to be if there's loading trucks loading at those spaces can those spaces even be uh, used at that point uh, the applicant was talked about making that possibly a one-way access which I think would help with that uh, but uh, a lot of the issues also go back to some of the drainage on the site uh, with that I'll turn it over to Mike to elaborate on further okay yeah we had a few um, outstanding issues that we need to work out with the design team I'll get to the plan um, there is a large uh, existing concrete flume um, and I can pull it up on the map and show you is the property right here south of Hedge Apple off of Lebanon Highway, Lebanon Pike. Um, on this lot two right here. So water from the north side of Hedge Apple uh, crosses in a little box culvert and then comes around this site. Uh, there's already an existing uh, pad that was constructed many years ago and this concrete flume goes around it. They're proposing to uh, build the building right up here. This is the, if you remember the chief, uh, or is it O'Reilly? O'Reilly Auto, Auto Parts uh, store right here that was pretty new. So they're, they're gonna put their building in here. Um, there is a three lane section. They're gonna bring their driveway off of uh, that's three lane section, so that's why it kind of meanders down. Uh, so people will have the ability to uh, stay in this three lane section to make a left turn into the site instead of coming in this uh, tapered area a little bit farther to the north. So, um, but going back to that, that concrete flume, um, what they're proposing is to drain the site, the entire site uh, to a, create a new flume, but they'll have to take out a section of this existing flume 
and it will be over the top of the section that's already there. So they're going to drain over the top of um, this existing flume, but they'll have to take out a section and create a, essentially a box culvert in this area. So we've been back and forth on that. Um, they believe that they can make that work. We just need to work with the design team, make sure that there are no conflicts and this drains freely to that. Um, and then, then the outfall goes uh, and, and can flow freely and have a, a sufficient slope to drain off off site here. So um, they still need to do a little work with that. Um, and like Doug said, they the, uh, they're going to make this a one-way section around um, the building to so if there is someone parked in this area here uh, one car can still uh, flow traffic and still flow around this area um, and circulation be completed around the building so like I said there's a few other things that we need to work with on them um, mainly that drainage uh, work in this this uh, new section out is what we need to work with the staff on most everything else there were some ADA comments I believe they've addressed those yeah we'll need a new uh, erosion prevention sediment control plan um, work so just just some minor things that uh, the staff will have to work out fortunately we some sites are uh, three pounds in a two pound bag but they have plenty of additional area that they can work drainage and ponds and stuff out so we're really not worried about that um, we just need to work with this, the design team and get these inks worked out it is on a state highway they will need a TDOT entrance permit um, with that um, that is all of our outstanding comments except for the ones that Doug had mentioned about landscaping and photometrics mr. chairman have a question please sure. uh, Mike is there I see a driveway on the uh, existing line for the O'Reilly's property just north of there yes, is sir. there any reason to go ahead and make that connection or is there any real benefit to that was not set up it seemed like that would function well uh, if it were a connection but we would have to get the permission from O'Reilly's right. to do that and right because it was not platted uh, with there's no easement to, to for an, an, a it looked like it fell easement. short of the property there didn't it it didn't it didn't really come all the way to the property line sure. so okay it looks like that gap that's that's the issue you're talking about right so um, the pad you can kind of see the limits of the pad here and they could kind of make it work but like I said there's no no cross access easement between that, them that's fine it looks more like just a turning maneuver just to give them some more room backing out of spaces there so just wanted to ask thank you questions Mike Mike is that is that you call it a concrete flume is that just a paved ditch or yes, is it really a, a three-sided open it is it no it has three sides and let me can so it's like a box culvert with no top yes right I'll kind of zoom into that and show you on pictometry oh yes right so you can kind of see it's substantial um, got walls on either side um, and takes drainage from the north side of Hedge Apple around the, the Riley's and crosses here at this little box cover bridge. So the idea is just put a top slab on it and make essentially a box they're, they're showing to cut it off and create a new box around it and then have a concrete flume, another flume on top of it to cross the water. I, I had talked to the design team uh, before this. Oops, let me. My thought was, well, you've got plenty of room to work. Why not just put your pond in this corner and and route your drainage around it? And so you didn't have to have a, a cross structure, but they think they can get this to work.
Ended up Jarrell with Huddleston Steel Engineering, uh, design engineer for this. That flume carries offsite water today, and it's it's a three-sided structure, poured in place concrete. Uh, so it carries all the offsite water. So what we've got is our site on one side of this flume, our detention on the other. So we're, we're going to take off. There's a little wing wall on the flume today. We'll take that off. We'll put a box, two by ten box on the end of it and then we will um, put our flume to carry our water over that well we're just going to allow the offsite water to keep doing like it is today we're going to put our water into detention and we'll dump into the property downstream uh, this is um, Walter Hill Plumbing the Bowers they own the property to the uh, south and the west as well uh, and, uh, but we've worked with Mike and Sheila, and we, we'll make this work. Uh, and uh, Sheila calls it armoring downstream. I call it energy dissipation, but we'll make sure that we uh, have riprap at the end of this culvert. Uh, it doesn't wash today, but we've got a ditch at the end of this that's, that'll carry. But it, that flume today carries the 100-year storm of the offsite water that comes to it. Uh, water isn't, to my knowledge, there's not any drainage issues. But we just didn't want to mess the offsite, leave it alone. We're going to go over the top of it and sort of work around it, kind of thing. And so we, we, we agree with the staff's comments and, and we can make this work. I have a question for Mr. Gerald. Um, one of the things that we've learned over time in planning is that the number of connections that you have to a major highway, limiting those number of connections is usually beneficial for the flow of traffic and for safety. Did you look at all at trying to share an entrance with that O'Reilly Auto Parts? Was that ever a part of a design conversation? It was not, because like Mike said, there's not an easement to allow that. Uh, original plan was just tied directly on to Lebanon Pike US 231 State Route 10 right in front of our site right there where Mike's showing. The staff asked us to move it further away from the intersection, further away from the O'Reilly's. So we, we've done that to accommodate uh, the staff's request of the driveway coming in. But right. there's not an easement with the O'Reilly's or a way to, to make that connection. And that gives them a little storage area to make these left turn lanes. Uh, turns into the site and, and they don't have to cross over this tapered area <coughs> the, the wedge right here so when I'm going to pick up my Spooky's Pizza a little bit farther up there's no turn lane and I wish there was so thank you Doug this is a site plan approval and you, you've mentioned a whole number of things is the thing ready I think the issues that it still has, we can work with the applicant. I don't think there's anything on here that rises to the level of a deferral, in our opinion. You're comfortable? Yes. Okay. With staff comments. And, and likewise, this uh, site plan is everything. It's construction plans and uh, site approval. So we still have to set up a pre-construction meeting, and we won't do that until all the kinks are worked out. Very good. Thank you. That being said, motion to approve with staff comments. I have a motion and a second to approve item 22-3018 FJB lot two. Other questions or comments? All those in favor of the motion to approve, please say aye. aye. Any opposition? Motion to approve carries. Thank you. Item seven. Staff reports, I believe you have a tiny home comment. Uh, yes, sir, thank you. Uh, we have a, hopefully a brief presentation that we'd like to make on tiny homes. And Mike, if you go ahead and pull up the uh, PowerPoint, please. This is something that, uh, quite frankly, uh, planning, engineering, and bo building codes, thanks, has been dealing with here for the last, I mean, it's, this has been a, an issue going on for quite a while. Um, what we wanted to do was at least kind of go over what our current regulations are, some changes that have happened, how we might be able to incorporate some of that into our ordinances and possible changes to the building code, if that's something the Planning Commission would like to do. So the first, Mike, I can't, could you just go ahead and just, I'll just say next slide, we'll just do that, that's fine. Just go ahead, thanks. So we get a lot of phone calls in our office. Now, obviously, I've never had anybody come to us with this picture. And I would like to, to thank uh, our 
our, our individual staffs, uh, you know, my assistant director, Daniel Glauner, and uh, Eric McMillan, my GIS planner, uh, we were all kind of involved in this. And then Tanya and her staff, uh, you know, I know she had a large part in, in putting a lot of this together. Also, uh, Josh Stan Sanders, our uh, fire marshal, he was involved in these conversations as well. But we'll get these phone calls uh, almost, I would say, not daily, but weekly. First of all, are they allowed in the county? Can somebody have multiple tiny homes on a piece of property? And even if they already have a piece of, or have a house on a piece of property, would we allow them to have a tiny home as an accessory dwelling unit, somewhere like, like a mother-in-law apartment or something like that? So we get these questions, like I said, if not daily, we do get these weekly, and they seem to be becoming more and more uh, common as, as time goes on. Uh, go ahead, Mike. Next slide. Thank you. So currently, uh, the zoning ordinance, RCZO, Rutherford County Zoning Ordinance, that does not permit or prohibit tiny homes. It's really silent on the issue as tiny homes as far as that goes. Now, if a tiny home, you know, quote, quote, unquote, can demonstrate meeting the building codes, it's treated as any single family home. It'd just be a smaller home, but it meets the building code. So we wouldn't treat it any differently than somebody wanting to build a two, 3,000 square foot house. But there are specific definitions for what a tiny home is and what it isn't. I'm going to let Tanya delve into that here in, in just a, a little bit. But um, that's really what we tell people when they call at this point. Look, if it meets the building code, you can use it. If it doesn't, you can't. So that's, that's kind of our canned response right now. Next slide, please. So talking about the building code, uh, Tanya, you're, I think you're up for these next few slides, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Good morning. So uh, Doug is correct in that we we do get um, calls on a regular basis, quite frequently, on whether tiny homes are uh, permitted in Rutherford County, and currently they're not. What we do tell them is, you can build a small house as long as you meet all the building codes. You can build it as small as you can possibly build it, and still meet all the building codes. Um, However, recently and probably in the last couple of years, we are getting an increase in on the zoning enforcement side of building codes. We do have, uh, we see a lot of people occupying RVs um, on, on a piece of property that's owned by a parent or a friend or something. We also see a whole lot of uh, the storage buildings, the ready removables that you see on the side of the road <laughs> for sale, um, these manufacturers are convincing um, citizens that they can move these to their home and modify them or, you know, stick a kitchen in there, put a bathroom in there and use them as a home. So we're seeing a lot of those as well. So um, tiny homes is, uh, we just thought that maybe it was time to consider, um, since they're out there in some form or fashion, you know, why not um, regulate them? So, uh, tiny homes, uh, as far as the building codes is concerned, the uh, industry standard is uh, 400 square feet or smaller, excuse me, less than 400, so 399 or smaller is considered, by the building code, a tiny house. Um, there is an appendix in the building code that, um, <clears throat> that regulates tiny homes, um, and I have given you guys, I printed it out and give you guys all a copy of it. So it gives um, some relief on, in some of these areas that, um, that are on this slide. It gives them some relief on habitable space, um, some ceiling heights, um, plumbing fixtures not so much, emergency egress, uh, they still have to meet it, however, um, it gives them so, some alternatives to have an emergency egress out of, for example, a loft area. And then energy efficiency. Uh, currently, the State Fire Marshal's Office has two programs. They have one for um, manufactured housing division. That is where the manufactured home is constructed in a factory and regulated by HUD. Um, it, it bears a plate that says it's been inspected and um, passed by uh, using HUD regulations and HUD standards. The other side of that is the modular home um, division. And the modular home division uh, covers a home that is not a manufactured home. So for example, if a home is built in a factory in sections 
and then delivered to the site and put on put together on site like a jigsaw puzzle like wall sections and floor sections and that kind of stuff that is a modular home a modular home is a home that comes in pieces but it's not on a chassis it has to be set up and constructed on a permanent foundation so recently um, the State Fire Marshal's Office included tiny homes into that modular home division section where they, um, they license manufacturers, and retailers, and installers to ensure that these homes are sold and installed um, and meet the specified standards in Tennessee. Um, if they are constructed off-site on a chassis, they are inspected through this program. If they come to Rutherford County being as a result of being manufactured somewhere else. Um, the State Fire Marshal's Office certifies inspectors to go out, third party inspectors to go out there and inspect them and they too have a plea on them that says that they were inspected using the uh, State Fire Marshal's Office modular home pro program. Um, that was just some of, the, some of the reasons why they have that program. It, it's developed to allow the construction, inspection, and use of tiny homes for permanent use. It ensures consistent and safe manufactured tiny homes. Uh, the inspections of the units built off-site are very similar to those that are built on-site on a permanent foundation. And then, of course, the decal will be placed on a tiny home after it's been inspected. So the uh, Appendix Q, which I also printed out and gave you a copy of, um, allows some relief in some of those areas, but probably the biggest thing it allows relief in is it allows a loft um, to be used as a sleeping area. Um, so it covers ceiling heights, lofts, stairways, you know, access to that loft area, and emergency egress out of that loft area. So Appendix Q would be covered if someone would choose to build a tiny home on a permanent foundation in Rutherford County from scratch. We would use the Appendix Q regulations to inspect that as we would a normal home. If it's built off-site on a chassis, it would be inspected by the State Fire Marshal's Office through their modular home program, and we would look for the decal when it's, when it's uh, permitted and placed in Rutherford County. Um, I just wanted to make a point <laughs> about the ready removables. Unfortunately, these manufacturers do cite and try to um, talk these homeowners into using these ready removal removables as a permanent residence. And, and the state does, number one, the code doesn't permit it, but number two, the state of Tennessee forbids it. It's prohibited in the state of Tennessee to use a ready removable structure for use as a residential recreational or emergency housing in Tennessee. They may be equipped with electrical and used for a workspace, so you can use them as a hobby shop or a workshop or an office or a craft room or you know something similar, but that's as far as it goes. And then uh, the other one is RVs. They are not permitted for um, long-term permanent use in Rutherford County. Thanks, Tanya. So along with the building code, if this is something that we would pursue, we'd also need to make some possible changes to the county zoning ordinance. Uh, these next two slides are similar information. The next slide goes into a little bit more detail. For one, we would have to define what they are. We would probably use the same definitions that we find in Appendix Q. Uh, it's already in the building code. There's no sense in reinventing the wheel. We would also like to look at our land use activity table, which is one of the appendices in our zoning ordinance. What our thought right now, at least, is is we would treat these the same as we would treat a single wide mobile home. Right now, they are used by right in uh, on properties that are five acres or larger. You know, it's just a single family home. We wouldn't treat them any differently. Or if it's less than five acres, we would allow them by special exception to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, we would probably develop some standards, uh, use specific standards in section 1103 specific to these kind of issue uh, these kind of structures and then also we could allow them as accessory dwelling units similar to what we would do with a single wide mobile home again right now we do allow single wides to be an ADU accessory dwelling unit but they do have to get a special exception approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals so Mike if you go to the next slide this is just kind of again this is really the same information here just uh and, and more of a of a try a uh, just uh, text form 
So that's kind of what we're, we're thinking right now. So uh, go ahead and, and move on to the next one. Now some other considerations, and I'm not saying this is something that needs to be worked out on the front end when it comes to tiny homes, but these are other issues that once we open the door, these are gonna be questions that are gonna start coming out. So go ahead. Uh, first of all, do we want to allow for tiny home communities? Uh, we don't have any here in Rutherford County that I'm aware of at least, uh, being in one of the municipalities or in the unincorporated area, but it'd be similar to say a mobile home park. Is this something that we'd like to make some zoning provisions for? Uh, of course, that goes back a lot of the same issues with a mobile home park would be here, you know, septic issues, uh, access, drain, I mean, the whole, the whole kit and caboodle would be there. Go ahead. And should tiny homes be allowed to be used for transient accommodations? Quite frankly, some of the phone calls that we get uh, are for people who want to have property. They want to put either one or multiple of these units on there and they want to rent them out as Airbnb, you know, short term rentals kind of things. Kind of what I see happening with these regulations is once we kind of get some regulations in place for tiny homes, the next project we're going to want to tackle are short term rentals. Because again, that's something along with the tiny homes that we get phone calls about almost weekly. Uh, and you know, similar, our ordinance right now is silent on it. And for a while, we didn't think we were going to really have to worry too much about it because it just seemed like it was never going to become as a big of an issue as it is. But there's a lot of reasons behind the fact that we're seeing and getting more and more of these phone calls each and every day for people that just want to, uh, you know, put up new units, rent them out on property, et cetera, et cetera. So these are some things, again, don't necessarily have to have an answer to uh, when we even come up with the original regulations if we decide to move forward with tiny homes, but this is something that we're gonna have to deal with on the horizon. Go ahead. And that's pretty much the uh, extent of the conversation that we have right now. Uh, we wanted to open up for discussion amongst the commissioners and any questions that you may have. Is this a direction you would like to go? Do you like the direction we're talking about right now as far as how we would regulate tiny homes similar to what we do for uh, single wide mobile homes? and just some of your thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. So with that, I'll be happy to answer a question. Tanya, those little mini barns that you see up and down the highway that people's <coughs> got them for sale, is that, is that what you said the state of Tennessee would not allow someone to reside in? That is correct. That is considered a ready removable and that is uh, prohibited in the state of Tennessee to be used as permanent housing. Uh, okay, if you put it on a, put it on a footer, no, you can't use them at all. Really? Not as permanent housing. You could use it as a workspace. You can put electric to it. They, they will not allow it to be used as a uh, residence, as a permanent residence. Dug a, dug a footer and did all that and it still won't allow it. That's, but if I went out there with a hammer and a, and a bunch of lumber and built one just like it, 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 it it's not removable, I could do that. Correct. Okay. Yeah, but they, uh, those ready removables are not constructed to meet the, the minimum code. Uh, there, some modifications would have to, even if they were alive, some modifications would have to be done to them and it would be more cost effective or cheaper to just start from scratch and build it yourself than it would be to purchase one and then modify it. I think the staff is, is uh, suggesting that they take a look at the tiny home situation, uh, come back with some recommendations. If we like those recommendations, we go through the public hearing process, the uh, updating our zoning ordinance, and then taking it to the county commission. That's the direction that I would prefer us to go. Anybody have a different one than that? Mike. Chairman, um, I, I have seen in, uh, in other cities, some really pretty uh, and interesting tiny home communities. Uh, some on the water or near the water and just some, like you said, like a mobile home community. Uh, very quaint, very pretty, very well kept. Uh, so I would certainly be in lean towards further discussion about uh, that potential. One thing that pops into my mind though would be if you were doing a community for that, do you then eliminate or prohibit the insertion of cargo, the steel cargo containers 
that a lot of people are also converting into homes. So that's two totally different types of construction. I've seen both and you can make both look very cool, but to put one type in mixed in with another, I think would degrade the beauty and aesthetics of what we think of as a tiny home. So that may have to be considered. I actually drove by a apartment complex in Nashville the other day that is made entirely of cargo containers stacked. It's like three stories and it's really cool looking, but they're made out of storage containers. Um, but that is something to think about. Uh, uh, so I would be in favor of at least starting with a community. Um, I'm not sure about uh, VRBO or the, the rental thing. That, right, and that's, that's, like I said, that's going to be a larger discussion because that goes way beyond just the tiny home. It's just it's going to be an aspect of that. This will at least give us a starting point to start kind of diving into those discussions because, yeah, th there's, there's a lot of uh, nuances to that. Sounds like Commissioner Cush is wanting to put his mother-in-law in a container to me. <laughs> <laughs> so we I think it's unavoidable, but I have a question about barn dominions. I'm seeing a lot of those. How are those regulated? Barn dominiums, where they build a, you know, a barn structure and then live in it, you know, supposedly temporarily, but many are for years. No, we have got, um, barn dominiums have become a regular <coughs> permitted um, thing. We require, if somebody comes in to us um, wanting to reside in a barn dominium or a barn, um, it, we send them straight to a structural engineer. The, uh, the code does not address a permanent residence in a barn. So the barn has to be designed to meet the minimum design criteria for Rutherford County where, where it applies to wind and snow and that kind of stuff. So the, the actual barn has to be uh, designed to meet that criteria. And then the home inside, if you'll imagine a safe room inside a larger building, that's how we require them to build it. So even if the barn is structurally engineered to meet the 2018 design criteria, we require them to build the house within that building to code. So it has to be sheathed on all four sides, stud walls, insulation. We don't allow them to use the exterior walls of the barn as the exterior, excuse me, talking too much, um, for the simple reason that if a wind was to come along, it would just peel back that metal and the home would be exposed, um, whether that's the, the roof or the walls. So we require them to, um, like I said, do the barn uh, with, as a, uh, from a structural engineer, has to be designed by a structural engineer, and then the home within the barn has to be built to code. And I'll add in, as far as uh, from a zoning standpoint, we, we don't treat it any differently than we would somebody building a single family unit with a garage. It's just a smaller home with a really big garage, basically, is, is what it boils down to. So, but yes, we've, we've seen several of those over the years. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for Doug, and one of them might, might actually be for Nick. Um, on the accessory dwelling units, if we begin to allow these, are we going to have to make any modifications to those rules, to the ADE rules? Yeah, we would. Uh, and uh, I kind of touched on that just real briefly uh, a little bit ago. We'd have to at least have to tweak them to say what's allowed and what's not. Um, so, yeah, whenever we do come with regulations, it'll be on several different sections. One of them would be within the ADU section. But my other question, and this may be for Nick, is... As a county commission, uh, county um, planning commission, we're not authorized to have architectural review unless it come th comes through as a PUD. So can we require, if we decide to do tiny home communities, can we require them to be PUDs? And, and then even possibly if it's an accessory dwelling unit, can we require it to be a PUD so we have some influence over the design? Bef yeah, before yeah. Nick jumps yeah, in yeah, on that one, Doug. let me at least say, uh, um, right now we, we we do have some, what I would say, basic criteria in there for ADUs. You know, we try to say, okay, it needs to at least be consistent with the style of the home. Now, we don't go into a whole lot of detail, and we're pretty 
lenient as far as what that means. Because uh, our, our biggest issue is we want it to look like someone driving by just doesn't look at it and says, oh wow, there's two houses there. You know, we want to think it's a, a single family home. Now, and I'll let Nick chime into this, my knee jerk reaction to what you're asking would say would be probably not, uh, just knowing what the state law is, but I'll defer to Nick on, on anything I, else. I, I haven't booked that issue, Ms. Allen, but as we go through this with Doug, I'll, I'll be certainly uh, working with them to get the language and the resolutions done correctly. And as the discussion amongst this body continues, I can get with Doug and we can look at that. And, and part of the reason that I ask that goes back to that core thing that we look at all the time, which is long-term livability. How are these communities going to age? And so if we have some, a little additional say-so on the front end, then hopefully they'll age better than they would if we don't. Right. And, and one of the protections that, that we built into the ADU section, which I think was, was a benefit, is the owner of the property is required to live in either one or the other units. And the reason we do that is, A, we don't want, to, we don't want it to become a de facto two unit structure or two unit property, just by the fact this becomes rental. You know, if somebody owns the property, lives in one, and they want to rent it out to a friend of theirs, I mean, that's their business, they can do what they want. But when it comes to the fact that the owner lives on the property, that gives them more of a vested interest into the condition of the property. They're gonna to want to make sure that the property's in good condition, at least in theory, so. Can I just add too that um, one of the requirements for both ADUs and these tiny homes is that they must be connected to a permanent um, subsurface sewage disposal system. So when it comes to communities, that might be a challenge. Um, based, I don't know that CUD would install a step system for a tiny, I mean, that's um, something we would have to look at um, as far as each of those tiny homes would be classified as one bedroom. But, I mean, if you sold them separately or rented them separately, you couldn't have a community septic system. Well, I, must, I guess you probably could, but it would be <laughs> worth um, a discussion. Pettis. Mr. Chairman, I see there's a whole lot here to discuss and to go over and whatever. I think the thing that really caught my attention and, and some of the material you're given here is that since 1973, uh, the size of homes have increased by 91%. I was before that 1973, and my children always get tired of me saying, you know, I grew up in a three-room house with an attached kitchen and no indoor plumbing till I was a junior in high school. But this was normal back in those days and what we have there. But now we have a group of people that are interested in these type of homes. And, um, you know, it's gotten to the point what, just like today, what we see we see huge houses being placed on small pieces of property. Well, we have some people out there wanting smaller houses that they want to put on larger pieces of property. And I think now's the time we start looking at some of this. And uh, if you need a motion to just uh, for our staff to put us something together to bring to us and where we go from here, I'd be glad to make that motion. Please do. But I'll make that motion for our staff to uh, place the information we've discussed here today uh, to bring it back where we can move from here. Very good. Second. I have a motion and a second. Everyone understand? Staff's going to look at it, bring back a recommendation to us. We'll go forward with that. Public hearings, approvals, county commission, those type of things. All those in favor of that motion, please say aye. aye. Any opposition? Motion carries. Thank you, Doug, for Thank you. bringing that up. You know, the tiny houses, it doesn't sound right. You know what I mean? It's like talking about tiny people. It just doesn't sound right. But, but, there, <laughs> but there's, uh, there's issues. We talked about mother-in-laws. You know, it, sometimes it'd be kind of cool to put something like that out behind your house and move your elderly mother and those kind of things. So I, it probably has a place in our future. So good discussion. Um, our next meeting is scheduled for September the 12th. It'll be a 6 p.m. public hearing meeting here in this courthouse. Let me make one quick announcement. I don't know how quick it's going to be, but uh, Commissioner Allen, uh, on behalf of Commissioner Reed, on behalf of Commissioner Cush and myself, we have enjoyed serving with you on the County Commission for 12 years. And it's been our pleasure. You have exemplified the meaning of County Commissioner and being well informed, well representing your area, 
and well prepared and a, an outstanding commissioner and a high participant when it comes to discussion. Those same things can be said about you as a planning commissioner. The last comments were made, were made by you, and we hear them month in and month out. If I'm not mistaken, you've been a planning commissioner for 16 years, so four more years than a county commissioner. Uh, that experience is hard to replace, uh, and I can't tell you how much you will be missed uh, by this commissioner, and I think by the rest of us here as well. And without trying to mush it up anymore, I, I can't tell you how much we appreciate your service to this county. Thank you, and we wish you well. <laughs> we had a really uh, tough discussion tonight on Pine Valley. I know your, most of, I know your hearts. Uh, mine is very similar to that. Uh, it's a situation that we were torn between making a decision that meets all of our standards and policies uh, and then another decision that emotionally says one thing, your mind tells you another thing. We are facing those decisions more and more every year, pretty much every month. Uh, so our jobs will not get any easier. But this commission is prepared to make those decisions. Once again, I am really proud of you and what you've accomplished. Not only that, but the way you know and realize uh, the, those decisions that we have to make. And not only are they decisions that we struggle with sometimes, but there are decisions that we reach that hopefully are in the best interest of the people in the county, uh, and we consider that as well. But thank you for that discussion today, and I know that decision was difficult for you to reach as it was for me uh, to, to reach as well, but thank you for uh, participating in that and uh, allowing uh, citizens to have their say. Uh, and uh, I think it was a meaningful discussion. Once again, I appreciate you guys. Uh, uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you. We are adjourned.